we're going to begin our discussion of sequences uh, in the next several lectures. And uh, we'll start out with sequences in general and some of the features of sequences and some rules and so on. Um, and then we'll talk later on about arithmetic sequences and then geometric sequences. Uh, and uh, we'll see where that leads us. But, but first we start with sequences in general. So let me uh, make this statement. A sequence is nothing more than an ordered pair, excuse me, an ordered list of numbers. And the ordered means we have the concept of the first number in the list, the second number in the list, and so on. Now the list, the sequence, can be finite or infinite. That is, we can have a finite number of numbers in the list, or we can have an infinite number of numbers in the list. The sequence uh, can be finite or infinite. Now, the truth is we're primarily interested in the infinite uh, list, a sequence of infinite terms. And by the way, each of those numbers is called a term. So the first number in the list is called the first term, the second number in the list is called the second term, so on and so forth. So let's just look at three examples here. So uh, two is the first number, four is the second number, six is the third number, eight, ten, and just by what I've written, you can kind of anticipate the number that will be after uh, 10, I'm sure. These are even integers, aren't they? Positive even integers. Okay, let's look at a, uh, a second sequence. Let's say the first entry, okay, the first term, the first number is one half. The second number is negative one fourth. The third number is positive one sixth. The fourth number is negative one eighth. And then you might be able to anticipate what the next number in this infinite list is. Uh, and you see that we have an alternating pattern of positive and negative, positive and negative. And we could also figure out the number. Now, I, I said we were going to have three examples. Really, this last thing I'm writing down is many times we refer to the numbers in the list uh, and their position by an index. We refer to the numbers in the list by some lowercase letter, and I'm choosing A in this case. So A sub 1, A subscript 1, would indicate the first number in the list. And then A subscript 2 would indicate the second number in the list. And A subscript 3, and then A subscript 4, so that index, that three, that one, two, three, four is called the index. And that just indicates where we are in the list. Okay. So if we had an A subscript 100 or A sub 100, we know that that's the 100th term in the list, the 100th number. It's at position 100. Now, the way we write terms of a sequence is usually we don't make a list, as I've written here. Usually, let's make like this down, writing terms of a sequence. And each one of those numbers is called a term. Well, it many times we refer to the list first we refer to, so each one of these is going to be an example. So we refer to the list by some lowercase letter, say like this, and we put it in set brackets because really this is a set of numbers. The list is a set of numbers. Um, and, and then we might see next to that or equal to that, um, these braces, those squiggly parentheses are called braces. We see something like this. Okay, well, what that really is doing is giving us a formula to how to create the list. Because we're assuming all of this, all of, when we see these ends, 
these subscripts, okay, these indexes. That's called an index. And it is assumed, it is assumed that these n values normally are positive integers. So they're normally positive integers. And we're assuming that the positive integers start at 1. So the n value, oops, integers, my bad. Okay. So the n values start at 1. Okay. And then we have an n value of 2 and an n value of 3 and an n value of 4 and so on. So that would, that is the case, the first term, the second term, the third term, and the fourth term. Now, what we see here that I've written down below it's telling us that if we have for the first term, so just make sure that we understand this, for the first term, that would be when n is 1, wouldn't it? And so if we were writing down these values in the list, when n is 1, then a sub 1 would be 2 times 1. I'm not making this very clear, I'm afraid. See, we want to know the first term, and that's when n is 1. And it tells us, well, what do we do? We calculate the position, whatever the n is, the position we're at, by 2. And so a sub 1 would be 2. So our very first position would be 2, our first term. And then when we wanted to know what the second term is, well, that's, the, you know, this number 2 is the n value. So that would be 2 times our n value, but this time our n value is 2. So we would have 2 times 2 or 4. So our second term is 4. And likewise, if we wanted to know the third term, well, that's indicated by a sub 3. But once again, that 3 is telling us the third term, but that's the n value. That's the index. And so if we want to know what a sub 3 is, once again, we'd have to say 2 times n, but this time n is 3. And so we would have 2 times 3, or 6, that's the third term. And now we could say, well, the fourth term would be when n is 4, and that would be 2 times 4, which is 8. And you can see that this is creating that list, that, that sequence that we had in the very top, the very first sequence that we had. Okay, um, let's look at another example now, and uh, uh, let's, let's say this sequence is defined by formula, more or less. We'll say that it's a sequence of B subscript ends, but all this means is that we're going to have a little formula here that it has something to do with the end that tells us what value the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth terms are as we go on and on. This time, the little formula is 2n minus 3. So I'm going to operate in two places. I'm going to start making the list up here, but I'm thinking first term. Okay. Well, first term is when n is 1. And so that would be b sub 1. But this says, oh, well, if n is 1, how do we calculate b sub 1? Well, it's 2 times our n value minus 3. And in this case, that's a negative 1. So our very first term is negative 1. Okay. Now, if we wanted to know our second term, well, our second term means n is 2. And that would be b subscript 2 if n is 2. And how do we calculate it? Well, 2 times our n value, which is 2, and then minus 3. Well, that would be, what, 4 minus 3, which is equal to positive 1. So the next term would be positive 1. And then if we wanted to know our third term, well, how would we calculate our third term? Well, the third term is when n is equal to 3. So we're talking about the third term, which we call b subscript 3, b sub 3. And how do we calculate it? Well, it's 2 times our n value, which is 3, minus 3. And in this case... What is that? 6 minus 3, that's a 3. Let's, let's do about 5 of these, and, and I bet after we do about 5, we'll be able to predict what the next ones are. So let's look at our fourth term. Let me make some space here. Our fourth term, of course, is when n is 4. And so that would be b, that would be b subscript 4, which is calculated by saying 2 times the n value, 
minus 3. Well, in this case, that's 8 minus 3, or a 5. So our next term is 5. Maybe you can guess now what you think the next term, the fifth term, will be. But let's see if we can calculate it here, the fifth term. Okay, well, the fifth term would be when n is 5. And so we're calculating the fifth term, b sub 5, and we do that by saying 2 times n minus 3. Well, that's 10 minus 3, which is 7. Now, it appears what we're doing, we started with negative 1, but we're increasing by 2 each time, aren't we? So I bet the very next term is 9. And you could actually figure that out. Let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that would actually be b sub 6, wouldn't it? And b sub 6, the 6 is the n value, so that would be 2 times 6 uh, minus 3. And of course, that's 12 minus 3 or 9, so we guessed correctly. So, you know, we could actually write this out in this fashion. Uh, we most likely would just be asked for the first several number of terms uh, given to us by that formula. But I still want to look at a couple more examples here. And, and the next two examples are going to have something, or the next example is going to have something to do with uh, how we get an alternating sign pattern. You know, we had one example that was a positive one-half and then a negative one-fourth and then a positive one-sixth and a negative one-eighth. And it's, un it's important to understand how that uh, every other one being positive or negative uh, routine can come about, how that pattern can happen. So let me get the, the next one written down on, on the next page. Okay, this... Uh, Next example, you can see the nth term, and that's really what we call this. This is the, uh, this is an nth term definition. We're actually defining the sequence by defining how to calculate any particular term. We have a formula for the nth term. So knowing n, we could calculate the tenth term or the hundredth term or the five hundredth term. As far as that goes, the millionth term. The millionth term would be when n is 1 million, and so we could calculate. So this, these are called nth term formulas, okay, uh, for how we are defining, if you will, uh, the sequence. So you can see this one's kind of an odd-looking creature. Uh, for the nth term, we take negative 1, and we put an exponent on it of n plus 1, and then we multiply that with 1 over 2 times n. So let's go through the process that we did just a moment ago. So the first term, okay, well, the first term is when n is equal to 1, and so in this case that would be c sub 1. And so we would calculate that first term by put, taking our negative 1 and putting an exponent on it that is n plus 1. And then we multiply that with 1 over 2 times our n value. Well, the important thing to notice uh, if, with this negative 1 is the power we have on negative 1 at this time is a 2 power. And, of course, if we raise a negative number to an even power, we will get a positive result. So negative 1 times negative 1 is positive. Well, we'll come and fix, we'll, we'll deal with that in a moment. And then we have 1 over 2 times 1, which is just a 2. So since negative 1 squared is positive, this is simply 1 half. So as we're writing the first term in to make our list, we'd say, okay, here's 1 half. Now, we're going to calculate the second term. So for the second term, we go through the same process. Now, if n is 2, of course, we're calculating c sub 2. This time, we take our negative 1, and we put a power on it that is our n value of 2 plus 1 more. And then we multiply that with a fraction that is 2 times our n value, and our n value is 2. Now, here we have a negative 1 to the power 3 times a 1 over 2 times 2, which is a 1 over 4. 
Now, the issue here is when you have a negative number raised to an odd power, you actually get a negative result. That is, negative 1 to the third power is a negative 1. So here we have negative 1 times 1 fourth, which is nothing more than negative 1 fourth. So our second term is a negative 1 fourth. Now you may anticipate that the next term will be positive, and you're right. If we look at the third term, when n is 2, then c sub 3 is, I mean, pardon me, 3, we're, we're calculating c sub 3, so it's negative 1 to a power of 3 plus 1. But 3 plus 1 is going to be 4, so we're going to end up with an even power again. Uh, we're multiplying with a fraction 1 over 2 times n, or 1 over 2 times 3. So we have a negative 1 to the power 4 times a 1 sixth, and negative 1 to the power 4 is nothing more than 1, so we have 1 times 1 sixth, so our third term is a positive 1 sixth. <clears throat> and we could continue. Let's do one more. Uh, if we're calculating the fourth term, of course, that's c sub 4. And c sub 4 says, oh, it's negative 1 to the power 4, because that's our n, plus 1, times 1 over 2 times 4, since 4 is our n value. Now here we have a negative 1 to the fifth power, so we've gone back to an odd power, haven't we? And uh, times 1 over 8, negative 1 to an odd power is negative 1, so we have negative 1 times 1 eighth which is a negative one-eighth. So our next term is negative one-eighth. And we could then guess probably, it appears, our next term will be positive, and, uh, and, and it looks like it would, should be a positive one over ten, doesn't it? And we can see that this pattern is going to go on. And that's what we had as an example in the very beginning. So be, because as our ends changed, as our ends changed, we went from a um, even power on negative 1 to an odd power on negative 1, to an even power on negative 1 to an odd power on negative 1. That's what caused those positive and negatives to appear. And any time n was an odd number, then when we take that odd number in and add 1 to it, we ended up with an even number. So as all of our odd terms were negative 1 to an even power. And that's what caused all of our odd-numbered terms to be positive and so in a similar fashion for the even-numbered terms, uh, the second term, the fourth term, and so on. Let's, let's look at one more example before we change what we're doing here. In, in this case, um, we'll say, I'm going to go back and using the a sub n to indicate. So the nth term formula, if you will, this time, is uh, 3 plus 2 times negative 1 to the power n. So I'm going to be a little less formal this time as we begin to write these out. I'm going to think, okay, n is 1. Let's look, what will we have when n is 1? We'll, we'll have 3 plus 2 times negative 1 to the first power. Well, negative 1 to the first power is negative 1. 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. So this is 3 minus 2, or 1. So the very first term is 1. Okay, when n is 2. Then we have 3 plus 2 times negative 1 to the power 2. But uh, negative 1 to the power 2 is nothing more than 1. So this is 3 plus 2, which is 5, isn't it? So our second term is 5. Okay, if n is 3, then our third term is 3 plus 2 times negative 1 to the third power. But negative 1 to the third power is negative 1, so this becomes 3 minus 2, which is 1. Oh, well, now we're back to 1. Huh. If n is 4, then we'll have 3 plus 2 times negative 1 to the fourth power. But again, negative 1 to the fourth power is just positive 1. And so we have a 3 plus 2, and we're back to 5. I'll be darned. Okay. So you could probably guess, and if you do, you would guess right in this case, that we would have a 1 in this position, and we'd have a 5 in this position, 
and then we'd have a one in this position, and that pattern's going to continue. Now, let's just, for kicks, check this out. Let's see. Here's the first term, the second term, the third term, the fourth term, the fifth, the sixth. Okay, that's the sixth term. Let's see what would happen if we calculated the sixth term. Well, the sixth term is when n is six, isn't it? So that would be three plus two times negative one to the power six. Oh, well, that's three plus two times a positive one. Oh, that's nothing more than three plus two, which is five. And sure enough, that's exactly what we have when we guessed after we saw several terms. Now, on the next page, we're going to uh, change strategies a bit. Now, here we've been given the nth term formula. We've been given a formula, and we've listed several terms uh, in the sequence that that formula defines. Now we're going to try to turn that around. We're going to be given a list of numbers. That is, we're going to be given a sequence, and we want to determine what the nth term formula would be. And that's a little more difficult. We'll set this up on the next page. As, as I said, <clears throat> pardon me, what we're going to do here is be given a sequence that is at least giving a partial list and see if we can't determine what, um, uh, what the formula would be that would create that list. So let me, let me write the first one up here. First number in the list, the first term is a 1. The second term is a 4. The third term is a 9. The fourth term is a 16. The fifth term is a 25. Okay, and it's going to continue. There is a pattern here, and so that's our job is to determine the pattern. So that what it is is we're going to define the formula that could create that pattern. So that's our question. What, what is the formula that will create that pattern? Now, as you're thinking about this, I'm going to go ahead and battle for a little while. And the truth is, some students figure it out very quickly. And other students look at it for a long time and have a hard time to figure out the pattern. And uh, I can't say that it's always going to be easy. Um, but if we look at the first term being 1, I mean, in fact, if we look at those values, those are all numbers that are perfect squares, aren't they? And, and if we think that, how can we get 1? Well, we can square 1. How can we get 4? We can square 2. How can we get 9? We can square 3. And you can see that then the first term is 1 squared. The second term, the second, second term is 2 squared. The third term is 3 squared and so on. And, of course, I can't see your faces and how you're reacting. But if we want to know the fifth term, then all we do is take 5 and square it. Well, the fifth term here is this term in this position, isn't it? That term, that's the fifth term. So we take 5 and square it. And, yes, this defines that sequence. This is the nth term formula for that sequence. Now, th this next one... Um, is also interesting, and it's something that you need to, to recognize later on. That is, well, let me write it down. What I'm doing is writing the list of positive odd integers. First a 1, then a 3, then a 5, then a 7, then a 9, and I'll quit writing after that, but just put the dot, 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 which means, of course, it continues infinitely. Well, so we want to know the nth term formula for this. What, how can we calculate that? And so let me, let me expand on this a little bit before we ever do anything. The, the, the first term is the first odd integer. The second term, the positive odd integer. The second term is the second positive odd integer. The term is the third odd integers. They're all odd integers. And it has something to do with their position as first, second, third, and fourth. Now, let me, let me first remind you 
that if we take any integer n and we multiply it by 2, then that's going to be even. Okay? That's going to be even. If you take a, an, an integer, whether that integer is 5, 2 times 5 is 10, or if that integer is 11, uh, 2 times 11 is 22, or even if that integer is even to begin with, 2 times 20 is 40. 2 times an integer is going to be an even number. Now, if I know 2 times an integer is an even number, if I take 2 times an integer and add 1 to it, the 2n is even, but if I add 1 to it, then that's going to be odd. Or, if I start out with an even integer, 2 times n is for sure going to be even, and I subtract 1 from it, then that's going to be odd. So if I want to create odd integers, I can multiply by 2 and then add a 1 or subtract a 1. That will create an odd integer. Well, let's see what we have here. We need n to be, uh, when n is 1, we need a sub n to be 1. And, and uh, I'm going to create an even integer. So I'm going to say 2 times n is going to be an even integer. Okay, and in this case, I know that's 2. Now, but I need, when n is 1, I didn't say that very well. When n is 1, yeah, then that's an equal to 2. But I need to create an odd integer, so I'm either going to add 1 to 2n, or I'm going to subtract 1 from 2n. And I think in this case, we say, oh, well, if I subtract 1, then I'll have 2 minus 1. Now, remember, n is 1 here. So I'll have 2 minus 1, which is 1, and that seems to fit. Okay, <clears throat> let's try another one just in case. Let's, let's try here. This would be the uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. This is a sub 3. Okay, so if n is 3, if I take 2 times n and subtract 1, that would be what? Um, well, that's not going to do it, is it? If n is 3, oh, my problem is n is 4, isn't it? My bad. My bad. One, two, three, four. This is at the fourth position, isn't it? So that's a sub four. So here we actually have n is four. If n is four, will we create a seven? Well, yes. Here's what we would have. Two times four, of course, is our eight. And then minus one will give us seven. The minus one makes sure that we get an odd integer. And now we've got it aligned correctly. If we would have said plus one, we would have been in the wrong position. So the formula for this sequence is 2n minus 1. That will create the positive odd integers if we let n start at 1 and go forever. Okay, let's look at one more here. But that, that's important uh, because of the odd integer and the even integer idea. That's kind of an important idea for other things in the future. Okay, let's look at this one. First entry is 2. The first term is 2. The second term is negative 5. The third term is positive 10. The fourth term is negative 17. And the fifth term is 26. And there is a pattern here, but I think it's not real obvious. Okay, so we're going to try to figure out what this formula is. I haven't gone away. I've been, I'm being quiet so you can be thinking about it. In fact, you might want to pause the video right here so that you can think about it and have as much time as you want to think about it. Of course, one of the things I see is this alternating pattern of, of signs. Start with positive, go to negative. Uh, then go to positive, then go to negative. And we know that has something to do with a negative 1 to a power. Now, we have some choices. We could have negative 1 to just a power n. We could have negative 1 to a power that is n plus 1. We could have negative 1 that is to a power n minus 1. I mean, we could do a lot of different things. But we want the first term to be positive. See, the first term needs to be positive. So we need to start with positive. And if I put a, a exponent of 1 on negative 1, I'm going to get a negative. 
So that's indicating to me if we want the first term to be first term to be positive, we're going to need this formula because then we would have negative one to the one plus one or negative one to the second power, which will be a positive, and that's the whole thing about it. It'll be a positive one. So I'm thinking at least part of our formula is going to be a negative one with an exponent on it of n plus one. That will get the correct alternating sign pattern going. Now, the problem is where in the world do those numbers come from? I'm going to give you a little hint, and then I'm going to let you stop and think about it. I'll give you a little hint. Compare the numbers in this third example to the numbers that are right up here. They don't consider the signs, just consider the, the numbers. The first term down here is a 2, which is one more than the first term here, isn't it? The second term here has a 5, and that's one more than the second term here. Third term here it has a 10, and up here, oh, it's one more than the third term that's right there. And now, if you look across here, each one of these numbers is one more than the numbers in that first sequence. And how did we create the numbers in that first sequence? We took n and we squared it. So let me suggest to you here... I think what we need here is a, the number we need to calculate is we're going to square the n value and then we're going to add one more to that. And I'll let you peruse and think about that and see if you think that that will create the sequence that we have there. And again, you could uh, pause and double check me. That would be a worthwhile thing to do, I think as I get started to do some things on the next page. So I hope you've had uh, enough time and, and took the time to check, check me out uh, by pausing uh, on that last sequence. See what uh, is stated here, we're going to uh, write terms of a recursively defined sequence. Recursively defined. Now, that's not what we've had so far. What we've had is sequences that are nth term defined. That is, we had a formula. If we wanted to know, as I said before, the 100th term, then we just plug in 100 for our n value and calculate the, the value of that term. But here, it's, it's a little different. Let me, let me write up the problem, the first example. Okay, uh, here's what we have. We're given this information, a sub 1, the first term, is 3. And then it tells us, it gives us this formula. a sub n is calculated by taking 4 and subtracting a sub n minus 1. Okay, well, let's first, what does that say? That said, a sub n minus 1 is the term right before a sub n, isn't it? So to calculate the, th the fifth term, for instance, we need to know the fourth term. See, if n is 5, a sub 5, then we need to know what a sub 5 minus 1 is, since n is 5. And that's a sub 4. So to calculate a sub 5, we need to know a sub 4. And that's what we mean by recursively defined. We can't go out and calculate the 100th term this time until we know what the 99th term is. And so this is, this, is a little, this is not unusual that things are defined this way, but it's certainly a little more of an issue if we want to know the 100th term or the 1,000th term or whatever. But let's follow the directions here. We have the definition, the recursive definition of this sequence. And we have to always know a beginning value and the formula that relates the next value to something before it, okay? Uh, anyway, we're to write the first five terms. So we already know that a sub 1 is equal to 3. So we'll start over here. We're going to write those terms over here, okay? So we're starting out with 3. We know a sub 1. 
Now, how are we going to calculate a sub 2? Now, keep in mind, that's when n is 2, okay? Well, it tells us to calculate a sub 2, the formula says, okay, a sub 2 is 4 minus a sub, remember n is 2, a subscript 2 minus 1. Well, 2 minus 1 is 1, so this is 4 minus a sub 1. And we have the information about a sub 1. a sub 1 is 3, so this is 4 minus 3 or a positive 1. So the second term is positive 1 here. Now we want to know the third term. The third term, of course, that's when n is 3. And the formula tells us how do we do that. Well, we take 4 and we subtract a sub n minus 1. Well, n is 3. So n minus 1 is 3 minus 1. So that tells us that we're actually subtracting a subscript 2. Well, right above this one, we have a sub 2. a sub 2 is a 1, isn't it? So this is 4 minus the 1 that we're getting from right there. Oh, that's a 3. So the third term is 3. Okay, let's see about the fourth term. Well, the fourth term is when n is 4. And so that would be a sub 4. And a sub 4 is 4 minus... And maybe we're seeing the pattern is 4 minus the term right before a sub 4. Well, the term right before, before a sub 4 is a subscript 3. And right ahead of us, we know what a subscript 3 is. It's 3. So this is a 4 minus a 3, which, of course, is 1 again. So there's our fourth term. Well, our fifth term would be a sub 5. And the way we calculate a sub 5 is we take 4 and we subtract the term that's right before a sub 5. And the term that's right before a sub 5 is a sub 4. And up right up here is what the value of a sub 4. So this is 4 minus 1, which is equal to 3. So the fifth term is 3. Now we might be able to guess what the other terms are, but we were only asked for the first five terms, and that's what we've written here. Okay, let me set up the next example, and we'll go through it. Okay, here we see that uh, the, the example says, the problem says, write the first seven terms defined by the sequence where we're given the information that a sub 1 is equal to 1, and the second term, a sub 2, is also equal to 1. But for the n values greater than or equal to 3, so for the third term, the fourth term, and so on, a sub n, the nth term, is calculated by taking a sub n minus 2 and adding to it a sub n minus 1. Now you might recognize right here, I'll point this out, that a sub n minus 1 is one term before a sub n. And a sub n minus 2 is two terms before a sub n. So this really says add the two terms that are before right before the term we're trying to calculate. That's really what that says. Now, in my face-to-face -face classes, and some of you may be in a face-to-face -face class looking at this, uh, I tell a story. This is, this is called a Fibonacci sequence. Fibonacci sequence. It is a recursively defined sequence, Fibonacci. I have a hard time talking and writing sometimes at the same time. If I'm chewing gum, I've really got trouble. Fibonacci sequence. So the story I tell is that um, if some of you are movie buffs or maybe even book buffs do a lot of reading, there's a book called The Da Vinci Code, and they made a movie out of that. And in The Da Vinci Code, if you've seen the movie or read the book, at the very beginning of the book, um, a, a museum curator... Uh, has been murdered. He's in, he's in the, uh, the museum uh, on the floor of one of the display rooms, one of the, uh, the viewing rooms, and uh, it's a gruesome murder. He's, uh, he's naked on the floor. Of course, we don't see that. And he's got some things carved into his chest. And uh, the, the hero of the book um, discovers that there is some invisible or some ink 
a message written on the floor in an ink that's only visible by shining a black light on it. So they ended up at, how that happened, I don't recall, but they remember they could figure that out. But they're shining a black light on this uh, on this message that's written on the floor. And the zero says, oh, that's a Fibonacci sequence. So if you've read the book, you might go look at it, or if you've seen the movie or have the movie, or the next time you see the movie, you might pay attention to that. But what we have here is a Fibonacci sequence. Now I'm going to, refor uh, uh, I'm going to record the terms right up here. So the first term, a sub one, we already know is one. And the second term, a sub two, we already know is one. So we're now worried about calculating the third term, a sub three. And the formula says, okay, if n is three, we take a sub n, which is three, minus two, and we add to that a sub n minus one. So that's three minus one. Well, if we calculate three minus two, that's a one. So we have an a sub one plus a sub, well, three minus one is two, a sub two. And we have a sub 1 and a sub 2 already given to us. That's a 1 plus a 1. So here we have the value 2. Our third term is 2. And that was really just calculated. That was just adding this 1 and this 1 together, wasn't it? Okay, if we want to know a sub 4, well, the fourth term, that's when n is 4. And the formula says, okay, take a. The index that we're worried about here is n minus 2. And then add to that a sub n minus 1. Well, 4 minus 2 is 2, and 4 minus 1 is 3, and so we're adding up the second and third terms. To get the fourth term, we're adding up the second and third terms. And the second term is 1, and the third term is 2, and so that's a 3. So this next term we have is a 3. Okay, a sub 5. Well, a sub 5 is a sub 5 minus 2 plus a sub 5 minus 1. 5 minus 2 is 3, so that's a sub 3. 5 minus 1 is 4, so that's a sub 4. So this is saying to get the fifth term, add the third and the fourth. Those are the two previous terms, aren't they? Well, the third term is 2, and the fourth term is 3. When we add those together, we get 5. Now, we could uh, we could check the we're supposed to have six term I mean seven terms aren't we? Well, a sub six if we follow the formula we'll say take a sub four and add to that a sub five that is add the two previous terms. Well, a sub four is three and a sub five is five and so we get an eight. Okay, and now we can probably guess that to get the next term, we add the 5 and the 8. See, to get, to get this term, we added the 1 and the 1. To get this term, we added the 1 and the 2, and so on. To get the next term, we're going to add the 5 and the 8, and when we add the 5 and the 8, we get 13, and we can check that. a sub 7 would be a sub um, 5 plus a sub 6. And if we look up there and figure out a sub 5 is 5 and a sub 6 is 8, sure enough, we get 13. Now that we know that pattern, I mean, this is all we were asked for, but we could continue uh, indefinitely, couldn't we? The next term would be 8 plus 13, which is 21. And then the term after that would be 13 plus 21, which is 34. And the term after that would be 21 plus 34, which is 55 and so on. We could continue. Obviously, those numbers are going to get kind of large, but we could continue with this pattern. Now, I have stuck in here because of, uh, of the book that we're using, and uh, there's, a, there's something that's kind of out of the realm of what we're talking about right now, and it's called factorial notation. So on the next page, I'm going to discuss factorial notation. Uh, but that's not fitting in directly with what we're doing right now. And we're going to come back to these sequences here in a moment um, and, and talk more about sequences. Okay, here we have, uh, like I said, we're going to discuss briefly factorial notation. Um, and so we start out with the assumption that we've got a positive integer n. 
and as a positive integer. In fact, in this case, we're, we're going to require right now, temporarily, that n be 2 or bigger, not 1. It's an integer uh, greater than or equal to 2. Then what you see then, n with an exclamation mark, we read that as n factorial. That's the way we read that. So, uh, you know, an example, we'll come down here and we'll look, look specifically, but an example might be 5 factorial or uh, 13 factorial. So that's an exclamation mark. That actually has meaning mathematically. So if we have n factorial, this is the way it's defined. We write down the integer n, okay? And then we multiply that with the integer that is 1 less than it. So 1 less than n would be n minus 1. And then uh, we multiply that with an integer that is 1 less than the one we just used. So we would take n minus 1 and we would subtract one more and that would be n minus 2. So we're multiplying with the next smallest integer all the way down. And we continue doing this multiplication until we get down to 3, then times 2, and then times 1. In other words, we're multiplying the first n integers to, uh, together, but we're writing it down in reverse order. So for instance, 5 factorial would mean we'll take the 5 and then multiply with a 4, and then multiply with a 3, then multiply with a 2, and then finally multiply with a 1. Well, of course, the 1 doesn't change things much, but if we do the calculation there, we will actually get 120. And then 13 factorial, oh goodness, that would be a 13 times a 12 times an 11 times a 10 times a 9. You can see this is going to be huge times a 9, times an 8, times a 7, times a 6, times a 5, times a 4, times a 3, times a 2, times a 1. And I don't even know what that is, but I bet you it's a huge number. And since I put it down here, I'm going to calculate it. But you know what? I'm not going to do this by hand. Hold on, let me get my calculator out. Okay, there I've got it. 13 factorial is 6 billion, 227 million. 20,800. That's what 13 factorial is. By the way, I actually didn't uh, go through the trouble of saying 13 times 12 times 11 times 10 and so on. Um, if you have a TI graphing calculator, there's a factorial command. And you'll find that under the math menu if you press the math button. And the math button will come up with a set of four menus across the top, and the last one on the right is PRB, which has which stands for probability. And then when you go there, you'll go down to number four and see that you have an exclamation mark. That's factorial. So I put in my 13, and then I went to math, and then to PRB, and then the fourth option, which gave me factorial, and it calculated it for me. Um, if you're interested in that, in, uh, uh, there's places that you can look to see a little better direction than, than my words. Okay. Well, there's a, there's a couple of things that we want to be somewhat used to, and uh, because we run into this occasion, and I, I'm going to call it, for no other better terminology, as factorial division. And we saw that 13 factorial is a huge number, 6 billion and something. So um, what would happen if we were asked to uh, calculate, and, and let's, let's even make it more challenging, we're asked to calculate what 12 factorial divided by 10 factorial is. 12 factorial divided by 10 factorial, but we can't use our calculator. Oh, well, it looks like it would be difficult. So what we would think about doing is, an, okay, 12 factorial. Well, that's a 12 times an 11 times a 10 times a 9 times an 8 times a 7 times a 6 times a 5 times a 4 times a 3 times a 2 times a 1. And we're going to divide that 
after we multiply it out by 10 factorial. Well, 10 factorial is a 10 times a 9 times an 8 times a 7 times a 6 times a 5 times a 4 times a 3 times a 2 times a 1. Oh, but then we look above and we look below and all of these numbers above will cancel with all these numbers below. And so all we really have is a 12 times 11. And 12 times 11 is just 132. That we could have done pretty easily. Now, I, I really want to show this in just a little bit different light. And, and because I don't want to write that stuff out. Okay, that's a lot to even write out. Why would I write all that out? So here's what I'm noticing. I'm doing division. The number 12 factorial is bigger than 10 factorial. And so I'm thinking of a special way to write 12 factorial. What I'm getting at is within 12 factorial, we actually have a 10 factorial, don't we? So if I was clever, I could write 12 factorial as 12 times 11 and then say times 10 factorial because the rest of it is going to be 10 factorial. Well, why did I stop there? It's because of the denominator I had. I have a 10 factorial in the denominator. And so I, if I would have been clever enough to recognize that, then I don't have to write all that business out. I'm canceling the 10 factorial, having 12 times 11, 132. So that, that's a, a little thought if you have division of factorials a way that you can appreciate it or approach it. Now, there are two special factorials that I need to get in here. Remember up above, okay, remember up above we said we were assuming, oops, we were assuming that n was 2 or bigger. Well, n could also be 0, and n could also be 1. So the two special ones, one factorial, well, that makes a little bit of sense. We say one and multiply it with the next lower positive integer, but there isn't one. So one factorial is simply one. But also, and this you just have to accept this one. We can't make much sense out of it, except it has to be defined this way for many of the important formulas to, to be true for these types of factorials. That is zero factorial. Now we don't have ever ever we don't ever say a negative number factorial, but we can have zero factorial. And by definition, by definition, don't try to make sense out of it. Zero factorial is defined to be one. So those are our two special factorials. Well, on the next page, we're going to continue our discussion of uh, sequences. But now we're actually going to start talking about adding the terms of a sequence. So a sequence is a list of numbers, and now we actually want to add the numbers together that are in that list. Okay, so that's, that, those are called summations, and that's what we're going to look at next. As, as I was just mentioning, uh, uh, we're going to talk about summing, adding terms of sequences. And as you see, I've written here, sometimes it is useful to add the first n terms of a sequence. You know, the first 10 terms, the first 100 terms, whatever it may be. So let's keep in mind now, we're starting with a sequence. Okay, so here I've got a sequence. And a sequence is just a list of numbers. So I'm just going to make a list. I'm not going to be real formal. Now, how about the sequence of even integers, positive integers, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, and of course this goes on forever and ever and ever. Now, suppose I'm wanting to sum or add the first five, sum the first five terms in the sequence. So that means I'd take the 2, and I'd add to that the 4, that's 2 terms, and add to that the 6, now we're at 3, add to that the 8, now we're at 4, and add to that the 10. Okay, so that's the first 5 terms, and we're adding those together, and just because we can here, this, this isn't the important part. It's not important right now what that sum is, 
Well, we can calculate that, and I believe, as I'm looking at that, we'd get a 30. Okay? But the idea is how we add them up. Now, in general, if we have a sequence, and we'll just refer to the sequence as the A sub 1s, so in general, if we have a sequence of terms, so the first term A sub 1, the second term A sub 2, the third term A sub 3, uh, the fourth term A sub 4, okay, and continuing, of course, the sequence is infinite. Now, that's just a list. If we're going to add the first n terms, well, in this case, we're not quite sure what n is, but we'll say, okay, we take the first term, add the second term, add the third term, and we're going to continue doing that until we get to the nth term, which we refer to as a sub n. And so this is the first n terms. Okay. Now, we have a way of writing that, because we don't want to write out a list adding together that way. And the way we write that is co it's called summation notation, or summation for adding notation. Okay, and that's what we're going to do here. And sometimes it's called sigma notation. And you'll see what I mean when I write this down. Sigma notation. Well, here's, here's how we show what we've got written right here. Here's how we show that in a little more uh, compact method. We write a capital sigma. That's a Greek letter. This is a great, the, and, and it kind of corresponds with the S, uh, if you will, in, uh, in English. But anyway, it's the Greek letter sigma. Whenever we see that sigma, then we know that it's telling us to add some things. And here's what we would say in this case. We're going to add up the piece, the parts of the sequence, and we have to refer to which ones we're adding. And remember, these all have an index, and so I'm calling that index K here. And so what we're, in this case, what we're doing is we're going to add to all of the A sub whatever's starting with a subscript of 1. See, K was going to start at 1. And we're going to stop adding until we get to where the K value is in. That would be A sub N. So what that's telling us, we kind of think of as we go through this, as if when K is 1, we have an A sub 1. The sigma tells us, well, now we're going to add the next term, and that's when K is 2. In K is 2, then that would be an A subscript 2. And then we're going to add... Again, as we increase K by one more, now K is 3. And we're going to keep doing that, okay, until we get to the number that's up here on top. And that means we're going to add, finally, when K is N, that would be A sub N. Now, um, the K, the, the thing called K is called the index. That's the index of this summation. Okay, it's called the index. You hear me refer to an index. And the one is the lower limit of summation. It's where the summing starts. Oops, of summation. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble writing. And the N up here, this top number, is called the upper limit of summation. It just tells us where our Ks are starting and where our Ks are ending. So it tells us the first term and the last term in which we're adding. Upper limit of summation. So what we want to do is, is practice on expanding things that are written in summation notation. So uh, on the next page, we'll go through several examples. Uh, let me, let me uh, get the next, the first one started. Okay, like I said, what we're doing here is expanding summation notation. That is, we're writing down what the sigma or the summation notation is telling us that we're adding. 
So in this very first example, when we come down here and rewrite what we're supposed to do, rather than overwrite the problem, and that's a k, the sum, sigma, the sum from k equal 1 to 5 of 2k. So remember what we're doing. We first start out with k being 1. And when k is 1, then we have 2 times 1, or 2. So that's the very first piece that we're adding. See, 2 would be the first term in the list that's called the sequence. Okay, now we're going to add to that what we get when we replace k with 2. We're, we're starting with 1, and we're going up to 5. So when k is 2, 2 times k is 2 times 2, or 4. So here we're adding a 4. Now we change our k to 3. We, we increment by 1 is what we call that. We're incrementing k by 1 each time. Well, when k is 3, 2 times k is what we're adding in, and 2 times k, of course, 2 times 3 is 6. So now we're adding a 6. And then when k is 4, of course, we're going to add a 2 times 4, which is an 8. And then when k is 5, and that's the last one we're going to add in, isn't it? We're adding 2 times 5, and 2 times 5 is 10, so we're adding a um, 10. And that's exactly what we had uh, in our earlier, earlier example, except we've written it in a new notation. Now, I, I may tell you that this is probably not what I would do if I was starting from scratch. I was using that to explain. But if I was starting from scratch, I'd say, okay, when k is 1, I have 2 times 1. And then I'm going to add to that when k is 2. So when k is 2, I have 2 times 2. And I'm going to add to that when k is 3. And when k is 3, then I have 2 times 3. That's what I'm adding. Next, I'm going to add when k is 4. So I have 2 times 4. And next I'm adding when k is 5, so I have 2 times 5. And so that's probably the way I would have written it rather than the pieces that I did above. And then I'd say, oh, well, that's a 2 plus a 4 plus a 6 plus an 8 plus a 10. And although it's not so important right now what that value is, it's more important on how do we interpret this notation. Okay, well, let's look at another example now. Let's expand. Let's expand, oops, uh, this time, the sum from k equal 1 to 4, 2 times k plus 1. Okay, well, here's the way I do that. The sum from k equal 1 to 4 of 2k plus 1. So I know I'm adding a bunch of things together. So first I'm letting k be 1. So I have a 2 times a 1 plus a 1 that I'm going to calculate. But I'm going to do that calculation, and then I'm going to change k to 2. And I'm going to add then, and I'll have if k is 2, a 2 times 2 plus a 1. And then I'm going to change k to 3. So what I'll be adding is a 2 times 3 plus a 1. And then I'm going to change k to 4, and so what I'm adding is a 2 times a 4 plus a 1. And then I would go back and actually do those calculations. In this first case, 2 times 1 is 2, plus 1 is a 3. In this second parenthesis, 2 times 2 is 4, plus 1 is 5. Oh, now this makes sense. 2k plus 1 is going to be an odd number, isn't it? Because 2k is even, add one more to it, I get odd. In the next parenthesis, 2 times 6 plus 1 is a 7. And in the fourth parenthesis, 8 plus 1 is 9. And so I'm adding 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9. Now, once again, I'm not so interested in what the actual value of this sum is, but it seems like right now it would be kind of interesting to know when I get uh, uh, 10 and 14, I get 24. Okay. Now, if we change this just a little bit, I just, I'm just to make a point, because sometimes, uh, sometimes what we're going to end up having here uh, is, is a, a, maybe a little less clear. Here we're asked to expand k equal 1 to n. 
So we don't know the top number. We're just calling it n in this case. Uh, same thing though, 2k plus 1. So we, we would kind of go about and say, let's look at this pattern. Well, we're going to let k start at 1, so we'd have 2 times 1 plus 1. And then we're going to let k to go to 2, so we'd have 2 times 2 plus 1. And then we're going to let k go to 3, 2 times 3 plus 1. And we're going to keep doing that until we get to where k is n. So we'll have a 2 times an n plus a 1. And then if we expand this, I mean, if we uh, do the calculations, we see that this gives us a 3 plus a 5 plus a 7 plus dot, 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 and the last thing we're going to add is 2n plus 1. So that's the way that we would interpret the expansion. It says we're really adding up odd integers until we get to a particular yet unnamed odd integer. So I've got a couple of more that I'd like to try out before we uh, go to some formulas and uh, properties of these summations. Well, here we're asked to expand... Uh, the sum from k equals 0 to 5 of 2 to the power k. And I think that you probably get the, the gist here, but the reason I'm doing this one is just indicating to you that we don't always, our index doesn't always have to start at 1. Here it's actually starting at 0, we could start at 5, and, and we could even start at a negative value uh, when we're just reading this notation. So, but here it's k is uh, from 0 to 5, and we're summing up 2 to the k power. So, once again, we're just going to say, let's start out with our first k. Our first k is 0, so that would give us a 2 to the 0 power. And then we're going to add and increment k. So now k goes to 1, and so we have 2 to the k power, or 2 to the first. And then we're going to add. And now we're incrementing k to 3, so we have 2 to the, I mean, to 2, pardon me, we have 2 to the second power. And then we're going to let k go to 3, so we'll have plus 2 to the third power. And then we're going to let k go to 4, so we'll have plus 2 to the fourth power. And then we're going to let k go to 5, so we'll have plus 2 to the fifth power. Now, <clears throat> I don't know what that sum is, but let's just write down the, res the results of the, each of those exponents. 2 to the 0 is 1. 2 to the first power is 2, 2 to the second power is 4, 2 to the third power is 8, 2 to the fourth power is 16, and 2 to the uh, fifth power is 32. So we could certainly get out that 40, 20, 60, actually I believe we get 63 there. I may be wrong, you, you might want to check me, but that wasn't the important part. The important part was the idea of expanding. Now, I want to do one more of these examples. Um, like I said, and then, then we're going to get to, into some things that are a little more technical. We're, we're going to have to work a little harder. Uh, expand, and this, this is to, to show a point. This is, again, something a little different. Expand the sum from k equal 1 to 5 of 3. Now, the first thing you notice is in the, uh, you know, in here, this 3, there's not a k value, is there? So what this is really saying is no matter what k is, we're adding a 3. We're adding a 3 over and over. So if we were to expand this, here's what we're doing. Starting at k equal 1 and going to k equal 5, and the sum is of 3. So when k is equal to 1, what we're adding is a 3. And when k is equal to 2, what we're adding is a 3. And when k is equal to 3, what we're adding is a 3. And when k is equal to 4, what we're adding is a 3. And finally, when k is equal to 5, what we're adding is a 3. So all we're doing is adding 3 5 times, right? That's what we're doing, adding 3 5 times. Or 5 times 3, that would be 15. Okay. Just because we didn't have a k in our summation uh, uh, formula there, I thought it was important that we look at something like this. Okay, well, 
as I've been alluding to, uh, we're going to continue the discussion on this summation notation, but there's some properties about these sums. Uh, there, there's some things that we can, can do with these sums uh, that make some calculations, and eventually that's what we want to do, make some calculations easier. So we'll start this up on the, the next page again. Okay. <clears throat> Properties of sums. There are three. There are three properties, or at least what I'm calling properties. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down the first property, the second property, and the third property. But as I write down the first property, I'm going to look at a couple of examples. So property one. Here's what it says. If we have a sum from k equal one to n of some constant, I'm calling it C, some constant times something, it's the formula involving K, if you will. So the, the property says, oh, now remember this C is a constant. That's a constant. That's something that's not changing. That's not changing when K changes. So if, if that's the case, that constant we can factor outside in front of that summation notation. And so we can say it's the constant of the sum times the sum from k equal 1 to n of just the a sub k. So let me give you a couple of examples of how this would apply, and then I'll tell you why it makes sense. This would be the sum, with, an example would be the sum from k equal 1 to 5 of 3 times 2 to the power k. And so the, the 3 is the part that is the constant. See, that's the c. Because no matter what k is, that's always a 3. So what this tells us is we can write that 3. We can factor that 3 out and write it in front of the summation. So all we have to do is worry about calculating the sum from k equal 1 to 5 of 2 to the k power and then we multiply that result by 3. Okay? Now, another example along these lines is we might have the sum, uh, I'll say from 1 to 5 again, from k equal 1 to 5, uh, this time of 3 times k. Now, once again, 3 is always 3. No matter what value k is, 3 is always 3. That's the constant. Okay? So by this property, we can take that constant 3 and factor it out, write it in front of the summation notation. So we have 3 times the sum from k equal 1 to 5 of just k. So that's, that's the way we could rewrite those. And there's a reason that we might want to do that, but we're not there yet to understand that reason. Well, let me tell, let me tell you why this makes a lot of sense. And I won't do this for all of the properties, but if we have k, the sum from k equal 1 to n of c times a sub k, when k is 1, we have c times a sub 1. When k is 2, we have c times a sub 2. When a is 3, we have c times a sub 3. When a is 4, you get the idea. And so we will keep adding those until we get to where k is n. So the very last one we're adding is c times a sub n. Now the significance here is that c is a factor of every term. So we could factor that c out. And if we factor that c out, we'd have c times, in parentheses, a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3 all the way up to plus a sub n. And, and by the way, this is just a sum of the a sub k's, isn't it? In other words, this is nothing more than c out in front, and what's in those parentheses is the sum from k equal 1 to n of a sub k. So it makes a lot of sense when we see it written that way. We're just going to get used to the property and use that property. Okay, the, I don't think I have room for the next property on this page, so we'll move to the next page for property two. Okay, the second property I've, I've got is partly written, but here, here we're 
are summing, we have a summation, a sigma, a summation of things that are either being added or subtracted, plus or minus. It's, it's one or the other. And uh, I'm just pointing, it's not having to write this down twice. Well, what this says you can do is you can add up the A values, that is we can sum from K equal 1 to N of the A values, and then either add or subtract whichever is appropriate with the sign that we already have on the left, uh, just sum up the B values from K equal 1 to N, the B values, the B sub Ks. So an example here, okay, a simple example, is we might have the sum from k equal 1 to, uh, oh, we'll just say 3 this time, of 2 to the k power plus 1 over k. And so this, this property says, well, we could write that as two summations. We could say, oh, it's the summation from k equal 1 to 3 of the 2 to the power k plus the summation from k equal 1 to 3 of the 1 over k. So we could break it into two summations is the idea. Okay, this third property is a little uh, more difficult to see that it is true. It's a little more difficult to see that it's true. Uh, let, me, let me write it down and then I'll uh, give an explanation for what's going on. Here we have the sum from k equal, now this isn't starting at 1, it's starting at some j value, one more than j value, okay, and going to n. And we're summing up a sub k's. Well, what this what this is is we'll sum up everything that is from k equal one to n of the a sub k's and subtract the sum from k equal one um, to j of the a sub k's. Now this is assuming that j is some number that is smaller than n. Oh my goodness, that's a lot to digest. So let me let me give an example, and from the example we'll begin to see why uh, why maybe that is the case. Um, let's suppose that we're asked to sum. Let's do this. The sum from um, k equal 5 to 10 of 2 to the k power, just as an example. Well, what this formula tells us is that that's the, see, and that's the whole idea. We're not starting at 1. That's really the big idea here, is what does this look like? And you, you could think, well, we could just write it out. And that's true. We could just write it out. But we're going to have formulas in the future that we want to use, and our formulas not, might not work if we start K at 5 instead of at 1. But here's, here's what this property would tell us. Well, we could add them up from 1 to 10, that is K equal 1 to 10 of 2 to the K power, and then subtract from that the sum from k equal 1 to j. Now remember, this 5 is 1 more than j. So that means we're going to go here. If, if 5 is 1 more than j, then that means j is a 4. Okay, so now that's what it's telling us that we're doing. Now let, let's see why this makes sense, and then when we need to use it, it, it may make sense how we're going to use it and why we're going to use it. Um, Let's look at let's look at this part that is the sum from k equal five to ten of two to the power k. Now, so when k is five, we have two to the fifth, and when k is six, we have two to the sixth, and when k is seven, we have two to the seventh, and so forth. When k is eight, and when k is nine, and finally when k is ten. So that's what we need to add up. Okay. Now. 
what we have on the what we have over here on the left side, let's look at what we have. We have the sum from k equal 1 to 10 of 2 to the power k minus the sum from k equal 1 to 4 of 2 to the k power. Now I'm going to write this down this way. The first sum is 2 to the 1 plus 2 to the 2 plus 2 to the 3 plus 2 to the 4 plus 2 to the 5 plus 2 to the 6 all the way up to, yeah, I'm tired of it too, 2 to the 10. In the second one, we're adding up, starting at 1, 2 to the 1 plus 2 to the 2 plus 2 to the 3 plus 2 to the 4. So what you see we're doing is in the first sum, we're adding them all up from 1 to 10. In the second sum, we're adding them all up from 1 to 4. But we're going to subtract away the first four of the sum. So that means we're subtracting these away using that, aren't we? So what we're really doing is we're adding starting at k equal 5 and going to 10. Now, the reason this is an important idea that we don't understand yet, why would we use the the formula here, well, we have ways to calculate sums when we start at k equal 1. We don't have a way so easily to calculate sums when we start at k equal 5. And so when we rewrite this, this right side has two summations that start at k equal 1. And so we might have a formula for each of those summations that we can actually use to calculate further. That's the thing. Probably not something we will use a great but it's something that we need to know exists. In addition to these three properties, there are four formulas for sums. That is, we have some formulas where we can actually calculate what the summation is going to be, rather than doing it by hand, if you will, adding, 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 adding. We have some formulas. There's four different formulas that you'll need to memorize. Um, and you, certainly these properties that I've just written, you need to memorize. Well, we'll start the formulas on the next page. Okay, here we're going to uh, discuss formulas for summations or for sums. And there are four different formulas. Uh, and so, as before, with the properties, I'm going to write down each of the formulas, and we'll discuss one at a time. Uh, the first one is the sum from k equal 1, and it's important to recognize that we have to be starting at 1, to k equal n of some constant c. And the formula says that that's equal to c times n, or we could say n times c. We actually saw an example of this on the previous page, uh, or maybe it was a couple of pages ago, where we added up, uh, we had the sum from k equal 1 to 5 of 3, and we ended up deciding that that was 5 times 3. And, and uh, again, this makes a lot of sense, because after all, what we're doing is when k is 1, we're adding a c. Remember, c is a constant. And when k is 2, we're adding another c. And when k is 3, we're adding yet another c. And when k is 4, we're adding yet another c. And we do that all the way up until where k is um, n, we're adding that last c. So we've got how many c's here that we're adding? There's n of them. And of course, if we add c n times, that's n times c or c times n. So the formula certainly makes a lot of sense. And it makes quick work out of some things that we're doing. That is, if we were adding from k equal 1 to 200, uh, the number 5, well, that's simply we can say, oh, well, that's going to be 5 times 200 or 200 times the 5. It doesn't really matter how we write that down. And if we do that, we'll get 1,000, of course. The second uh, formula is the sum from k equal 1 to n, okay, so that's some number we're going to be given here in a moment, of k. And uh, what that's really saying, let's, let, before I write down the formula, 
let's see what that's let's see an example of, of what this is telling us that we're going to be able to add up that is if we have the sum from k equal 1 to 10 let's say of just k well then when k is 1 we're adding a 1 when k is 2 we're adding a 2 when k is 3 we're adding a 3 and we're going to continue doing that until we get to the value 10. So we're adding up 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10. So when we see this, this is really telling us we're adding the first 10 integers together. Well, here's what the formula tells us that we can do. Here's the way we can calculate that. We take the last number we're adding to, the n, and we multiply that with one more than that number, n plus 1. So it depends on the number that's up here. And then we divide all of that by 2. That's the formula. So if we use that below, what this would say is since our n is 10, that's right here, we would say the result we get is 10 times 10 plus one more and divide all that by two. And if we do this calculation, we'll get uh, 10 times 10 times uh, 11, okay, 10 times 11 all divided by two. And of course we could simplify that because 10 over two is five and we'll end up with a 55. So the formula tells us that we can calculate that as a 55. Now, there's a real interesting story that goes with this, uh, and, and it's pretty much uh, documented in, in the literature. Um, a man by the name of Carl Gauss, but at the time he was not a man. He was just a youngster, a young boy, uh, a German boy, okay, Carl Gauss, probably one of the most influ influential, man influential mathematicians that's ever lived. And he actually lived from 1777 to 1855, I believe it was. Okay. So a while back, he was a child prodigy. Well, the story goes like this. One day, um, he was in arithmetic class. Uh, and at this time, in, in this time and in Germany, it was probably mostly young men young boys that were actually the ones that were going to school and being educated. And the schools certainly weren't like they are today. Um, there would be a, a large number of age groups in one class. So uh, it, it's told that he was nine years old. Okay, that's, that's the age that he was. In, uh, was. And uh, he was probably in class with uh, kids that were anywhere from seven to 15 years old in this arithmetic class. Well, he has a crusty old, gripey old schoolmaster that's the teacher of this class. He's just hard to get along with. And I guess uh, maybe the, the story goes that he was uh, not in a very good mood one day and was upset with the class. So uh, he told them all to, uh, uh, as punishment, he told them all to uh, add up the numbers 1 through 100. Add up 1 through 100. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. At that time, they had to write on slates. They didn't have paper. They had to write on slates. And with a mat and within a matter of seconds, uh, young Gauss, only nine years old, in there with a bunch of older boys, just a matter of seconds, he tossed his slate up on the teacher's desk, and, and uh, the teacher just thought he was being foolish and being a little troublemaker. Uh, anyway... So I guess it took some time for all these boys to get finished. And I guess uh, the headmaster there was just uh, taking his time out. So after they were all done and all they had stacked their slates up on the teacher's desk, the teacher turned them all over so that Gauss's was on top. And he pulled off Gauss's. And lo and behold, Gauss had the correct answer. And here Gauss said, okay, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 all the way up to 100, he said the result, the answer is 5,050. Well, the teacher just couldn't believe that was, that was 
that he had gotten it correct in, in just a matter of seconds, and he had waited a long time to figure that out. Well, here's what he saw on the slate. The teacher was amazed by this as well. Young Gauss uh, took those integers, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, let's say he keep, kept doing this. He got up to, let's say, 97 plus 98 plus 99 plus 100. And then, on the other hand, he wrote all those numbers in reverse order. 100 plus 99 plus 98 plus 97 plus, it did all the way down to uh, 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. And if you take a look at the results there, in the first case, 1 plus 100 is 101. And 2 plus 99 is 101. And 3 plus 98 is 101. All the way across here, you'll notice that those pairs of numbers add up to 101. Well, then how many 101s are there there? Well, there's, there's a total of 100 of those numbers, 101. So if he multiplies 100 with 101, that's what that last line adds up to. But that last line is actually adding 1 to 100 two different times. So if you split that in two, you ought to get the correct answer. Well, a little arithmetic here will say that, look, 100 over 2 is 50. So this is 50 times 101, and that calculates to 5,050. <clears throat> okay. Gauss went on to do a lot of amazing things, and I'm not sure he's credited with this formula, but look what the formula would tell us here. The formula, adding up the first 100 integers, would be the sum from, one equal, uh, from k equal 1 to 100 of k. And the formula said, well, then take 100, that's the n value, that's up here, multiply it with one more than that 100, 100, and 100 plus 1, and divide it all by 2. And you see that's exactly what we have above that young Carl Gauss did when he was only 9 years old. 5,050 is the result of that. Well, we have, I don't have any more stories for the, the, remaining, the remaining two uh, formulas, but I'm going to put the next two formulas on the next page. So the third formula, unlike adding up the first n integers, here we have the sum of k equal 1 to n of k squared. So we're adding up the first n integers being squared. So if we, if we looked at what this told us that we would have, we'd start with k equal 1, and so we would have 1 squared. And then we would add to that, when k is equal to 2, we'd have plus 2 squared. And then we would have plus 3 squared, and then plus 4 squared, and we could continue that until we got to our last number, which would be n squared. So this formula tells us how we can add those up. So for instance, and here's what the formula says. It's a little more involved than our last one. And I don't, like I said, I don't have a good story here. But it's a fraction. And we take the value n, that's the last uh, k value, and we multiply that with n plus 1. Well, that looks kind of familiar. But then we multiply again with 2n plus 1. Okay, so the numerator is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1, and we divide all of that by 6. So let's just do a little check here, just so that we can see that this actually works. Let's see the sum of, of, from k equal 1, we'll say of 4, to 4, pardon me, of k squared. Now, on the one hand, we know that that means 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared. Okay, that's what we're supposed to be adding up. And of course that would be 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus what, 16? And I believe that's 20. 1 and 9 is 10 and 4 and 16 is 20. Oh, that's actually 30, isn't it? That's 30. My bad. Okay. Now the formula would tell us this. 
obviously if we have small numbers, this is not such a big deal. But if we're adding from 1 to 100, then it would be a big deal, wouldn't it? The formula tells us here's how we would calculate that by formula. Our n is 4 here. See, that's our n. So we would have 4 times 4 plus 1 times 2 times 4 plus 1. And we would divide all that by 6. Well, that would be 4 times 5 times 9, wouldn't it, in the numerator? All divided by 6. And 4 times 5 is 20. And 20 times 9 uh, gives us, what, 180. So this is 180 divided by 6, which is, in fact, 30. So it's just a, a small example to show that it works. It works in that small example, but it is true for uh, any number n that we're adding to. And the, uh, the fourth formula is summing the cubes of the first n integers. That is the sum from k equal 1 to n of k cubed. So as I was showing a while ago, if we were adding up uh, in this case, what that would mean, when k is 1, we would have 1 cubed. And when k is 2, we would have 2 cubed. And when k is 3, we would have 3 cubed. And if we're going to n, we would add up to where we had plus n cubed, whatever that n value is. Well, this formula looks like the, there's a couple of ways to write it, but the, the most common way is that we're going to square some fraction. And the fraction we're going to square is n times n plus 1 divided by 2. So that looks like the fraction in formula 2, doesn't it? But we're squaring that result. Now, another way this can be written, and that's just dealing with laws of exponents, if we square that fraction, we're going to have n squared times n plus 1 squared all divided by 4. That's the result of that, but I probably prefer the, the top form of it. And, and again, I don't, think I, I, mean, I don't think I'll go through an example this time, but we do need to commit these formulas to memory because we're going to be using these on, on tests. Now, obviously, when you're doing your homework, um, you can look the formulas up, but you need to be in the process of trying to get them memorized. Well, we're going to use the uh, properties and the formulas for these sums and summations to do some fancy calculations that would be difficult otherwise. And we'll start some of these examples on the next, uh, on the next page. Okay, we're, what we're doing here, as I just was mentioning, we're going to use the properties, there are three of them, and formulas and there are four of those to find the sums of these sequences to, to, to do some summation, to do some adding in a fancy way. So the first example, I'll say example one here, is the sum uh, from k equal 1 to 200 of 6. Okay, We just have a 6 there. Now this is actually, we use the first property on this. Remember? I mean, the first formula, the formula was if we have the sum from k equal 1 to n of some constant, then the result is that n times c. Now, it's required that we start at 1, otherwise this isn't going to work. And, of course, the n we're getting is the stopping place. So when we do this calculation, then it's real simple since we're adding a 6, which is constant, it's certainly just 200 times that 6 or in this case 1200 so it's an easy calculation to do okay example two in this case what we're asked to do is add that is sum from k equal one to fifty to k now let me let me just come over here and to remind you what we're doing. Okay, now and we're not going to do it this way, but remind you what we're doing. We're adding up fifty different numbers, and what they happen to be is all even numbers because it's two k that we're adding each time. So when k is one, we're adding two times one or two, and then when k is two, we're adding two times two, which is four. 
And when k is 3, we're adding 2 times 3, which is 6. And we're going to continue that until we get to where k is uh, 50. And so when k is 50, we're adding 2 times 50, or 100. So we're actually adding up all of the integer, even integers in this case between 2 and 100. Now, in this case, we use a property. And, and the property said this. Okay, let me remind you of this. I think this was property one. I believe so. The pro uh, uh, I think that's what it is. Just don't hold me completely to the number of it, but I'm pretty sure, yes, it is property one. And the, and the property said if we have the sum from k equal one to n of some constant times some piece that involves k. That is, the, the formula there, this part involves the k stuff, and c is a constant. Well, then, then what we can do is we can factor that constant out, and then we can add, we can make the sum from k equal 1 to n of the a sub k. So that's the property we're going to use here. And, and so when you look at what we're asked to, ask to sum up, k equal 1 to 50 of 2 times k, well, the c is the constant, isn't it? I mean, the, the 2 is the constant c, and the k is that a sub k stuff, okay? Because that's the only part that involves k, so that's our a sub k. Well, then that tells us what we could do here is we could factor that constant 2 out. And if we can't factor that constant 2 out, we have the sum from k equal 1 to 50 of k. Now, we have a formula for that. And, and that was what? Formula number 2, I believe. We have a formula for that. See, formula number 2 said if we have the sum from k equal 1 to n of k, if we're adding up the first k integers, then that formula is n times n plus 1 divided by 2. Well, right here, we're adding, we're, we can apply that formula. So we've got the 2 that's in front of it. And when we apply the formula for the sum from k equal 1 to 50 of k, our n value is 50. So we'd have 50, looking at our formula, times 1 more than 50, 50 plus 1. See, I'm looking right down here. And we divide all that by 2. Well, in this case, then, I guess we could begin simplifying, and we could think, oh, well, we can actually cancel those 2s, and we'd have 50 times 51, and when we calculate 50 times 51, we'll get uh, 2,550. That's easy calculation. So the sum from k equal 1 to 50 of 2k is 2,550. Okay. Let's do um, a couple of more of these. Um, and, and let me set up on the next page to do the next couple. Okay, in this example 3 that I just wrote down, we're to calculate the sum from k equal 1 to 26 of 3k plus 1 by using summation properties and formulas. Now, please go with the spirit of what we're doing. I suppose you could write this out and get out your calculator and start adding, but then you're not learning anything. And uh, maybe very well, it may be in a situation where you're not allowed to use a calculator on a test and it would become quite cumbersome. Now, before we actually go about doing the calculation, let's just again notice what this is really, what's really going on. Okay, just so that we have some feeling for what we're doing. Uh, we don't really need to know this to get the problem done, but it's kind of nice to know what's happening. So if we started with k equal 1, notice what we would be adding is 3 times 1 plus 1. k is 1. 3 times 1 plus 1. Well, that'd be a 4. And then when k is 2, we would be adding 3 times 2 plus 1. Well, that's 6 plus 1, that would be a 7. And then when k is 3, we'd be adding 3 times 3 plus 1. 
Well, 3 times 3 is 9, plus 1 more is 10. And then when k is 4, we'd be adding, what, 3 times 4 plus 1, 12 plus 1, or 13. Actually, it looks like we're adding every third integer, doesn't it? So anyway, we're going to be adding these up, and the very last one we're going to add is when k is 26. Well, I've got to stop and think. What's 3 times 26? I believe that's 78. So 78 plus 1 more would be 79. So we're adding up the integers in a particular pattern, 4 plus 7 plus 10 plus 13, all the way up to 79. Well, we're going to use um, a couple of properties and one formula to do this. So let's, let's start out by looking at the sum from k equal 1 to 26 of 3k plus 1. And what I'm noticing right away is the sum is of things being added together. And we had a property that said if you have a sum, I'm not going to write the, the K business over here, but if you have a sum of things being added together, that you can actually break that into two summations. See, we can actually break that into the sum of the first one plus the sum of the second one. And so we can break this into a sum from k equal 1 to 26 of the 3k plus a sum from k equal 1 to 26 of the other part, which is just a 1. Now, in the first summation, the sum of 3k, that's kind of like what we had in example 2. That 3 is a constant, and so we can factor that 3 out. Let's factor the 3 out, put it in front of the summation. So we have 3 times the sum from k equal 1 to 26 of just a k, plus the sum from k equal 1 to 26 of just a 1. Well, now we have actually two formulas. On the first summation, the sum from k equal 1 to 26 of k we're adding up the first k integers, and we have a formula for that. That's formula number two, okay? And now we just use that in example two. So write down our three that's in front of the summation, and the formula we're going to use, our n value is the 26. And so it says n times n plus 1, and divide that by 2. So that's the summation from k equal 1 to 26 of the k. Now, in the second summation, we're just adding up a constant. The constant is 1. We're adding it up over and over. And that's formula number 1. And it says take the n value, which is 26, and multiply it by the constant value, which is 1. Well, now we've got all of our numbers done, and so it's just now doing some calculations. And, and as I look at this, I'm just thinking of how I'm going to simplify this. In the, um, I've got this 3, and I'm noticing in the fraction, 26 over 2 is just a 13. So I can say, oh, well, that's a 13. And then I'm multiplying with the parentheses also, which is 26 plus 1, or a 27. And then over here, I just have a plus a 26. Now, if, if I get out my calculator real quickly here, 3 times 13 times 27 is 1,053, I believe, plus the 26 I have over here. And when I add those together, I get, uh, oops, I calculated incorrectly here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, let's see. I, I need to recalculate. Just just a moment for me. Let me, uh, hold on, I'm going to recalculate. 3 times 13 times 27. Well, what is that? 3 times, sorry about this, 3 times 13 times 27. I actually get 1,053. That is true, okay? 1,053 plus... 26. Okay, well then that's what, a thousand and uh, what, 79? So that's the result I get. If I were to add up all those numbers, I'd get a thousand seventy-nine. 
Okay, one last example. Um, we're going to use a little different formula here, but we'll do something very similar to what we've just done. Next page. Okay, in this case, we're asked to uh, calculate the sum from k equal 1 to 12 of k squared plus 1 by using summation properties and formulas. And although we're not adding very many numbers together here, which we could do our, with our calculator, but please do this in the spirit of what we're trying to learn and not just getting the answer, okay? Uh, because, again, later on, we may be doing this where, where it's k equal 1 to a million. And obviously, we're not going to do that with our calculator. So, uh, as I did before, this is not really part of the problem, but it's just kind of nice to know what we're actually doing here. So, as I look at this, I'm thinking, okay, what would this be? What would this be doing? When k is one, I would have one squared plus one, which is just a two. So I'm going to add to that what I would have when k is 2. Well, when k is 2, I have 2 squared plus 1, and that's a 5. And then I would add to that the value I get when k is 3. And when k is 3, I have 3 squared plus 1, and that's a 10, isn't it? And then k would be 4, so I'd have 4 squared plus 1, which is 17. And then k is 5, I'd have 5 squared plus 1, which is 26. And we're going to keep doing this until we get to where k is 12. And when k is 12, I have 12 squared plus 1. And since 12 squared is 144, plus 1 would be 145. So I'm adding up the numbers. I really can't tell all of the numbers in between there, but you see kind of some pattern that we're adding up. Now we can do this by using, we can actually do this calculation by using the summation properties and formulas. And so uh, the first thing we're noticing is that we have a sum of an addition. That is, what we're summing up has an addition in it. And so we can use that second property of summations, which tells us that we can actually break this into two separate summations, similarly to what we just did in the last example. So we have the sum of k squared from k1 to 12 plus the sum of 1 from k equal 1 to 12. Now, in this case, <clears throat> we're using a different formula. In that first summation, that is, we've got a formula. This formula for the sum from k equal 1 to n of k squared, remember, that's formula number 3. And it's a little more complicated, but it's n, this number up here, in this case, that's a 12, isn't it? times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1, all that's divided by 6. So we're going to use that formula right here. And in our case, the n value is the 12. So we have a 12 times a 12 plus a 1 times a 2 times 12 plus a 1, all divided by 6. And when we come to the second summation, that's the sum of the constant 1 as we go from k equal 1 to 12. And so remember what that is. That's that, that n value, that 12, times the constant that we're adding up 1. So we just have a 12 times a 1 there. Now, as I'm looking up in this first formula, I'm noticing that's a 12. Let's just write it down. It's a 12 times a 13 times a 25 all divided by 6 plus the 12 we have here. And then we just do a little calculation. I mean, I, when I'm looking at this, I think, uh, oh, well, 12 times 6, I mean, 12 divided by 6 is a 2. So this is a 2 times a 13 times a 25 plus a 12. And, of course, I'm doing this in my head instead of my calculator, but a 2 times 25 is 50. So up here I've got 13 times a 50 plus a 12. And I think 13 times 50, I can get, what, 500 and uh, another 150, so 650. I believe 650 plus that 12 there. And when I add those together, I get 662. So that's the value. That, that's the sum I would get if I added all those numbers up individually with my calculator. Like I said, now, next time it might be from k equal 1 to 120, 
and the formula would be almost as easy to use. We just have a few bigger numbers. We certainly wouldn't want to add 120 different numbers with our calculator. Well, that's, uh, that's our introduction to sequences. Um, later on, we'll talk about some special types of sequences and adding up some additional special types of sequences, but that's another, uh, another lesson. So we're finished for now. Good luck on your homework.